everybody and welcome to 40k Fight Club. This is episode 10 with the name that is hidden in the title and I can't see. Ah, uh, ah, uh, oh no. Uh, the Clown Show goes on, I think. I think it's that. I, I'm totally, <laughs> Come totally aware. Come and see the Clown Show. Come and see the Clown Show. You wrote the name. How <laughs> do you know? <laughs> I didn't put it in the text. Well, if you look, if you look at my name, uh, this side. Nope, this side. <laughs> <laughs> I was asleep 15 minutes ago, so this is going great for me. Uh, I started a new job last week, as I said, so uh, I am currently uh, awake in six hours for work. So we have two hours for the show, and I'm going back to bed because I need to start taking a nap before the show so that I can continue to provide you guys with the terrible content that you know and love. Because this, as they said, is episode 10. Uh, and I, for one, I'm looking forward to a wonderful show. Uh, I have had a wonderful weekend of 4K. I got to go away to a tournament. I got to play... Uh, one last go with 12 high guard, and I managed to lose in the finals to Harlequins. Uh, and I choose to believe that that's uh, not a thing I care about. Um, I, I'm choosing to believe that. I'm not sure I believe that, but I'm choosing to. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I ended up coming third of that one, which is nice. We don't have to talk about my list for a change after I go to an event, uh, which is great because I hate that and find it incredibly awkward. How are you guys <laughs> doing? How's your, how's your week been? How's your, uh, you get away from any events? You get any painting done? I got none done. Painting is not a thing on my mind at the moment. Uh, I'll go first. I didn't do a whole lot this weekend, just hung out, uh, played around with some of the new stuff on the way, so that was a little bit cool. Um, just playing around with things, trying to see where we go. Obviously, we got the super exciting news that there's a data slate coming, yay! Woo! Praise be! And we're choosing some... to be happy about that, regardless of the content, because it can't yeah. be worse. Well, we don't know what it is in it yet. It'd be stupid to be mad about something we don't know. So don't do that. If you do that, um, this is me, Anthony, calling you not smart if you're mad now. It's too early to be mad. Uh, you're mad on Tuesday. It's fine. Like, yeah. It's plenty relax. time to be mad in the future. Yeah. Save mad for later. Right now. Hope. Hope. Um, so, yeah. Pretty excited about that. Uh, pretty excited on the off chance that they turn my clown army into a melee army. That would be pretty cool. Probably won't no, happen. No, no buffs would... for no buffs for Quint. No buffs for Harlequin. I didn't no say life. buffs. I just if you gut their shooting enough, they'll be a melee army by default. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they get changed to army weapons skill six, they'll have to do melee. Simply. That's what I'm saying. If they just do to them what they do to everybody else, then it's fine. Anyway, how was your weekend, Nathan? Uh, I was up really late on Saturday morning submitting my thesis draft to my principal investigator so i did that so Woo! one step closer to getting my phd that's where i'm at right now i did also assemble and get more nids ready so i've got do you not have all the nids yet kind of fixes i have like three thousand points of nids now because Where'd somebody was selling from? a collection and now um a friend of mine was not interested in playing tyranids anymore so i was like i'll take all that and he was like okay and so i took all of it what I'm hearing from that is longtime Tyranid player Nathan. His army's been around. Exactly. Yeah. I actually have my third edition codex still. Uh I won't I won't lie. I have it. Uh other than that, I haven't been doing a terrible lot. I've got a bunch of Tyrant Guard and stuff that I've assembled and some bunch of Tyranid Warriors. So I'm I'm kind of ready to play bugs. And Good. then play Harlequins and hope that Harlequins turn back into a melee army that I loved because that would be great. I hope they don't. I hope they turn into non army. Personally, um, that'd be great. Uh, okay, everybody. What do so, you mean? Well, also, so, before oh. we go too much further, everybody, watch out because there have been like tons of fake balance slate leaks. Don't get yourself all bent out of shape yet. Wait, wait well, until next week. I did see the one that says the guard get an extra two. That's a point of the playing against model quins, and I think that one might be real. Oh yeah, that that definitely <laughs> seems to be the kind of thing they would do. So anyway, guys, this is 40K Fight Club. This is the main show. Uh, this will be running for about an hour and a half, slightly, maybe slightly less than about an hour and 20 minutes. Then we're going to take a quick break for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to be back, back for the bonus round, which will be the last half hour of content. In order to see that, you need to either be, one, here at the live stream at youtube.com slash c slash best in tabletop, or you need to be a member of said YouTube channel. That is a paid subscription that will get you access to us and also a bunch of the battle reports that are done for um, whether that's the the stream what was it called battle of the generations um the you generations. can get access to the second half of chasing the narratives you get access to the bonus right of our show lots of extra content on there it's really worth doing um and we will absolutely absolutely love you and if you don't uh we'll only love you if you're on the live stream if you're on the podcast do leave a review if you're on the youtube watching back 
do leave a like, do drop a comment, and do subscribe to the new channel. And that'll get you notifications for all the good stuff. Um, yeah, you guys weren't watching any of the content recently? Uh, yeah, the the like bit reps, I guess they've been calling it that they're doing, have been really good. Those like short form battle reports are really really awesome. Uh, being able to like, I don't know about you guys, but between making content for 40k, playing 40k, I don't have a lot of time for watching 40k. So those things are pretty much my primary form of content consumption these days. Um, so I really I do enjoy like those things. And start watching some short run content because um, I have had a lot less watching time than I'm used to these last. Couple yeah, of exactly. <laughs> so yeah, they've been really good for that. I really enjoy that type of sure. things. The battle for the generation stuff is good for that because you get to watch the higher level guys play each other. Cool. So, as always on the show, we are going to have a couple main sections. We have themes of the week, where we're going to run through the primary storylines of this week in 40k. We're going to have the stats breakdown with Nathan, and then we'll have a bit of a mech break, and then we will go through the results of the week with myself and Anthony and Nathan all talking about some of the good lists from this week. Then we'll do a bit of a meta discussion, generally, uh, myself and Anthony. That's going to be a bit shorter this week, because uh, the meta is about to die, and I can't wait. Uh, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll be back for the bonus round where we will take some listener questions and also do our responses to Anthony's question of the week. So, with that, Nathan, would you like to kick us off with themes of the week? I would love to. So I've got a little story for everyone. Tyler goes to Games Workshop, says he's depressed, says meta seems harsh and cruel, says he feels all alone in a threatening world where what nerfs lie ahead are vague and uncertain. The doctor says treatment is simple. Great clown Pagliacci is in town tonight. Go and see him. That should pick you right up. Man bursts into tears. Says, but Games Workshop, I am Pagliacci. All right, Nathan, how so that is our... the week? Oh, I mean, the gift that I put in our show notes is a bunch of clowns on fire, so there's that. Um... But the clones are doing the firing. That seems to be the problem. Yeah, well, I mean... Well, they, they get fired on in the finals by the other clowns, right? True. Reasonable. I mean, it's like fighting ninjas who are on fire while you're riding on a train trying to get away with some from something. That's what it's like. Mm -hmm. The clowns are on fire to make you sad. Because you have to fight uh, clowns that are on fire. That seems bad, yeah. But I guess I will, I'm going to quickly talk about this. I'm not going to go too in-depth in all the stats this week. The stats are pretty similar to the last couple of weeks, but I'll go through the top 10s and the top 4s and some GT winners. Pull out some highlights, and then we'll talk about some overall faction rep like data, and then we'll talk a little bit about some bonus factions just for funsies. And then I have so how many a special events are we pulling data from this week? We're pulling events data from 10 events, and then I have some fun stuff for Anthony at the end about Blood Angels, which I'm sure he'll love <laughs> and appreciate. Um, so first we'll talk about, so custodes were the best performing faction over the weekend because of how this sorts things, which is that custodes got 19 top tens, seven top fours, but didn't win any events. Uh, Harlequins are next and really Harlequins are the best performing faction, but it, this is only a two level sort. So we'll get through it. Harlequins got 17 top tens, 11 top fours, and then won six GTs out of 10. Uh, well, they didn't Tau attend had 13 them, right? top just that that's the fun stat. They were at six out of ten GTs and they won six out of ten GTs. You ruined the punchline. But yes, I don't want to, they won it's not a punchline. It's the, the headline stat. Yes. They won every GT that they were at. So they won a hundred percent of the GTs where Harlequins were either played or allowed. Because there were a couple GTs where they were like, please don't bring your competitive stuff. We're all sad. Um, which is fine from a certain perspective. That's an <laughs> odd choice for a tournament. Yeah, I, I'm not going to criticize people's rules packs. I just read the stats. I just don't. I don't. I get it. At the same uh, time, tower and... if, you were, if you were at a rock, rock, paper, scissors tournament and you showed up and you started throwing Lizard or Spock, I'd probably tell you to F off too. So It's true. But only if Towden... it was a tournament where you weren't allowed to. Yeah, if, but I mean, maybe people just start inserting their own heart controls. How do we know they're real? <clears throat> Well, it depends on how what form their rules are in, right? If they've Absolutely. not got the printed ones in front of you, then they're strictly illegal. <laughs> and as always, people will nah. love the meta references and in jokes on Fire K Flight Club. It's everybody's favorite part of the show. Yes, please join Best in Tabletop Network on the Patreon to get access to the Discord, where you can find out more about all the inside jokes that we tell as we go. I promise, yeah. they're all. Fun you won't understand the show unless you know the background lore. <laughs> <laughs> background lore is important. Not That's the true. 40k lore. 
It's really important. Um, so then we've got Tau with 13 top 10s, two top fours. Tyranids, seven top 10s, four top fours. Then we've got Orcs with seven, two, and two. So seven top 10s, two top fours, and two wins. Craft World's pulling up the last one that I pulled overall, which is six top 10s, three top fours, and zero wins. So Harlequins have about 5% of the meta right now, and they're at about 5.6 times more represented in the top four than they're supposed to be, which is an absolutely ludicrous number. Uh, yeah. Um, Sigmar did their stats for this, like how well factors do it getting through the like the four on one or higher records. Uh, and their mm-hmm. highest representation was below two, like over representation. I mean, in fairness, mm-hmm. ours would have been any other week, right? <laughs> no, Harlequins. except for Harlequin. Before Harlequins. Yeah, yeah. before so, Harlequins, right. Yeah, Ty, were kind, Ty got up there a couple times, but I think Harlequins are yeah, doing a little dirty. Yep. Yeah. Prior to this, we hadn't really seen anything above like 2.6 or 2.7. Three was kind of the cap on that. Now Harlequins have been at like over five, two weeks in a row. So right. they're Which is a lot. the previous record. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just yeah, not they're very doing repre- a lot of... Their representation is low and their win rate is extraordinary. Yes, they're, they're only 5% of the meta, which doesn't put them at like the tippy top. The tippy top is still basically custodies who are 10.5 and custo- or Tau who are 8.6% of the meta. And then still. Unified Marines in like the 15 range as usual. Yeah. And yeah, thankfully didn't Marines have another super weird week, run. right? Where Marines there was were last week. represented then. Yeah. It was... It was last week where Marines got beat out by Custodes. Definitely a thing. Definitely yeah, a thing I like we don't need to do. Not living in that world. Not living in that world is a good thing. And I'm proud of that. <laughs> so yeah, Harlequins have a tier all of themselves. Uh, Harlequins had a 79.8% win rate, which is absolutely grotesque. And pretty much only hit didn't hit 80 because somebody at Gibraltar went 0-6 with Harlequins. I promise we um, weren't going to so speak about paid... that. Tyler, uh, Nathan, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All, all by themselves, dragged that 0.2% away to keep Harlequins from hitting 80. I don't know. If we get told off, uh, director, director hate mail to Nathan Henning. He is hybrid one somethings on YouTube. Uh, direct all your hate mail to him because that was me. I accept it. It's fine. And then uh, 75.4% overall since Codex release. So the rest of these numbers are going to be since Craft World Eldar release. Uh, Tyranids are at a 53% for the week and then a 55.5% since Craft World Elder release. That's Anis's so fault. Tyranids are kind of in an okay spot. It's mostly thanks to Anis. Custodes are at 61.6% and a 64% overall. Tower at 582 so they've dropped back down under Custodes for the first time since their book was released, essentially, and are at 62% overall. Craft World are at 56 for the weekend and 543 since release. Soup is at 53 and 58.3 since release. So Craft World or Esriani and then Soup or Eldari are doing very well. Uh, we're not really seeing Craft World repeat the 42.2% that we saw that first real weekend that they were released. Maybe it was just an aberration, but something we can talk about a little bit later. It might have more to do with list construction and player base than it has to do with actual faction power. Uh, Then the bonus factions that I kind of wanted to talk about were Chaos Demons, who did 59.5% over the weekend and are at a 53% win rate since Craft World Elder release. So Demons are actually doing okay, which I kind of like seeing. Um, I guess there's something there that maybe we just don't know about. And then for Orcs, we have them at a 55. Hmm? But are they placing or are they just like win rate good? They're just mostly doing win rate. They do yeah, have some top I, we, 10s. We've touched on this but... already. Demons like dunk on all the really bad factions right now. Um, mm-hmm. And they have a decent shot into a couple of the good factions. Like You can win games against Custodes and tie with them. Uh, and even Harlequins if you like to get really lucky. So like they do not yeah. like Bellacore. <laughs> not a huge fan. No. Now. So there is definitely worlds like you can just pick which one about whether it's like the, the three keepers and Bellacore and Road to Change List that we saw do really well at Manchester. I think four and one there. Yeah, they have a good time into some of the uh, the weaker armies, and Disciples of Bellacore especially really, really, really hard to tie, um, which yeah. is enough to get them a solid win rate right now. And then it's Orcs, where at 55.1% over the weekend, they did win two GTs, but there were two of the GTs that didn't have any Harlequins in them. And they're at about a 48% since Craft World Elder release, so I'm not really sure that they're in like a great spot, and the tournament wins that they got aren't particularly like interesting results on the whole, since they... Didn't have any Harlequins players, but they did have Eldar players at them. 
But I believe also that one of those events was one of the events that was like, we want to have fun. So, <laughs> I mean, not that events aren't fun, but they wanted people to bring more off meta choices is kind of the theme of that event in particular. Then I promised a Blood Angel set, so I'm going to bring it uh, four top tens, one top four, and one GT win for Blood Angels. The yeah, of baby. Being that it again I... was one of the events with no Harlequins in it. No. Yeah, it was like one of the events with no Harlequins in it. The, but that was the one that banned them. And so Context. it's not getting it's not getting in the list. Context. And then one of them was too small, right? <laughs> so <true>. next. <laughs> No nuance in my statistics, only numbers. Yeah. The, yeah. the next thing somebody was tell me is that they were playing well when the Rage and Born Hero successors. That would hurt me. Don't tell me if that's true. <laughs> I don't. I don't actually know that one because I didn't. I didn't look at the list. So if somebody listed themselves as Blood Angels, but were secretly playing Drew Kari, that... I wouldn't know any better. Um, I have a tournament next or weekend. Or were secretly best in faction Blood Angels could be yours by playing one event. <laughs> Somebody did in the chat ask about Drakari. Drakari over the weekend pulled a 50.6% win rate, and they only top end at one event, if I remember correctly. Yep, they top 10 one event, and they top four. There was only one Drakari at my GT. It was really confusing. Yeah, so they got one top 10 and one top four. So they're not really doing too great. They've kind of fallen off pretty significantly at this point. Although, supposedly, we're going to see more Drukhari rules in the next upcoming campaign supplement. Hold out, hope, so, boys. Maybe something new. An army we'll, of renown. We'll rise again soon, Maybe, maybe as Drubile Vect is getting a new model that will be released as part of a supplement for the Cabal of the Blackheart. Mandrake's army of renown. Come on, dude. Ex acceptable. <laughs> what? Acceptable. I will take it. Why, Why not? Why do you hurt I don't me? know. Because full boss happened. Why do you hurt me on air? You can you can wound then, me all you like in our free time. Why must you cause me pain in front of others? And then Astra Militarum are proving that Chaos Space Marines do in fact need that second wound by displacing Chaos Space Marines to take third from the bottom for the guard. And Chaos Space Marines are in last place overall at 30.1%. With the Death Guard being super slow and ponderous at 30.6%. If you're still playing pure Chaos Space Marines, I also have concerns for you because you should just be playing Chaos Soup. There is no incentive not to be. And, um, and it's not like Space Marines are doing that much better. They're fourth from last, and they are at a glorious 42.1% win rate. But it no, is quite a get, hop. They did get two oh. people, they got three people into T Web this week. There it is. Three people, yeah, they four three people into T-Web. Not sure how. Uh, volume, I think. Accident. <laughs> Accident. There's, enough, the there's still enough Space Marine players that sometimes you can just only play Space Marine players for rounds one to five. Hold on. <laughs> Curie in with the news. The Blood Angels player was a real Blood Angels player, not a successor. Well, not somebody well, pretending to be a Blood Angels player. It was Sweet Lou, wasn't it? Blood Angels player. In the same sense that Pinocchio was a real boy. He just didn't start as one. Um. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, other than that, the med has not really changed a whole heck of a lot. If anybody wants to ask me right now or later on during the intermission about more faction statistics, we can talk about it. The faction V faction data is not super interesting at the moment. Uh, Harlequins Never. don't have any Never. bad matchups. They're basically just bad matchup list so i don't really feel like talking about it anymore so instead i think we'll cut our stats segment a little short this week and transition into results of the week results of the week i have notes on this one it is we are going to be speed running these quins lists except for the ones at fool's errand because ding dong the witch is dead and we would play the music if it wasn't copyrighted um imagine in your heads the disney property where it's like ding dong i think it's disney is it disney it sounds like disney was it was it was disney, right? It's just oh, old. Yeah, I don't know if it's Disney. Like, we're definitely going to get copyrighted if we play it. So uh, imagine yep. the, the music from The Wizard of Oz, Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead. Uh, we're choosing to believe that the balanced data slate is good. That is the belief we, the express opinion of this show is that we have the pre-knowledge that the balanced data sheet is good or we're going to bed for six months. Um, those are the two choices. So yay, yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great, guys. We're <laughs> looking forward to it. going to be good. 
Exactly. All right. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six GTs of size 28 plus uh, that didn't have weird house rules to go through this week. Uh, we're going to be covering <laughs> broadly two each, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion back and forth about, upon them, and then we're going to go into our meta discussion. So, uh, Nathan, would you like to kick us off with Fantasia Fanatic? The That is a big number. That is 41 in uh, Sweden, 82 players, and five rounds. Yep. So we have Axel... Raiden. I'm not sure if it's Raiden or Raiden, but playing light with nine voids and five by five troops. It's a pretty standard light Harlequins list. We're not really going to go into the details of them, but really good job to Axel taking an 82 player. Essentially, that's a super major home, isn't it? Major. What? Is that quite a ma- major? Is it a super major or just a major? Preserved 256. Oh, it's like okay. 200 ish and, and five, seven rounds, I think, is the minimum. Yeah. All right. I always forget what these breakdowns are because I only care about five or more rounds. Um, That's fair. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump through the Gibraltar GT. This had uh, 66 players and was unsurprisingly in Spain. Uh, no, Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> just, just make up, make up places. It's fine. Um, yeah. This was a six round GT and uh, was attended by like a fairly decent set of players. These events are normally um, fairly fluffy. The, the SM Battle Force ones. Uh, but no, this had like a bunch of the Team Spain guys, a bunch of the Team Netherlands guys, and also uh, Manny was there as well. Manny also went 6-0 with almost the same list as the winner. Uh, but the winner was Rude Steinbackers on light eight voids. Ooh. Mixing it up uh, with five Star Weavers and a... The, the only note I could write down for an interesting thing on this list was he has a Thirsting Darkness Solitaire. I don't know what that does. Ooh. Anthony, you enlighten us? On what Give me darkness. one second and I'll tell you exactly what it does. <laughs> That's the auto advancing six inches one. I thought as much, but I want to make sure because I think there's two components to it. Because that is definitely a that is definitely a, a strong contender for the best, the second best King City name after Princess. Oh Lewis. yeah, I mean, Thirsting Darkness is definitely rank one. It's right. I also there. wonder how that actually interacts with something like Blitz. Can it you does, Blitz? It doesn't. Okay, that's why it's not very good. That's why I don't know what it does off the top of my head. It's also the same cost as Prince of Sins. It's like 20 points. It's also not the one that like lets you just start, that makes you start a deep strike, right? Which is just the downside. No. It is. That's the auto haunting si- one, yeah. Auto six, consoli- uh, auto six advance, and when it piles in to consolidate, extra three inches. Okay. It seems okay. It is the same price as Prince of Sins. It seems less okay. Um, people have been don't telling me Prince of Sins is terrible because sense. it's just minus one to hit, but it also turns off rerolls against you. So I feel like people Rural's are dead, uh, yeah. drastically, drastically overselling how bad that is. It's um, it's not bad. It's not better than having twenty more points of Harlequin stuff because you, when that guy gets hit, he dies. Like it doesn't. There's no like, oh maybe. I don't know. I was charging him with Gene Sealers and he was sticking around. That guy does his trick once in my experience. He goes ha ha, and then he gets turned into a cloud of dust okay next up we have the fool's errand gt in canada this one was 64 players and five rounds and anthony is going to run us through aussie melo meloch meloche i'm going to say both and hope one of them's right aussie's double aussie's dark harlequins list this list is gaming so this absolute hero is playing dark which is already a step off meta and we got a shadow seer with all the stuff we got two troop masters you know punch mode uh the real exciting part is the troop choice where there is just an ungodly amount of troops on foot for those of you keep in track it is four units of 10 with no transports at all uh and then nine void weavers but we'll just ignore that last part for a second four by ten troops is super interesting how he got them around and up the table, no idea, but good on him for getting it done. Um, he Flip did bats. have Fog of Dreams on the Shadow Seer, which helps a whole bunch, because you can cast it on a unit, and if functionally it works like Cloud of Flies, um, but obviously slightly better, because you get the minus six in range, you have to get within six to shoot them. Uh, so the, on, a, on a unit that you are exposing, that's really good. Um, he also had the Death Jester, though again, Death Jester without a transport, a little confusing. But he did something right. He got four hundreds and one ninety three. So pretty, it's pretty cr- gaming. Crushed it, yeah. The ninety three was against the mirror. So, 
<laughs> he got them off the table, but the table is the opponent trying to with Void Reavers. Yeah, that sounds about right, Yuri. Fair enough, That's, Yuri. Why you gotta... And I mean, Logic that, that might be the trick. <laughs> okay, so you know how in a regular Harlequins list, nobody shoots the Void Reavers because you can't kill them because they're they're light and minus six range and all that, yeah? Alright, in this list, they're dark, so they die faster, but it also means that people think they can kill them by shooting them, and then your troops walk up the board because when they're not just the troops, they don't do anything, and then suddenly the troops are on top of them. Yeah, those ten troops will kill, kill the hell out of like three intercessors. Three, four guardsmen, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or you can be me and watch 15 players try to kill a Carnifex over the weekend and watch the Carnifex walk out of it in the next turn. <laughs> you know, average. Um... Um, so I've got Grand Onslaught 3, which was a 54-player event in the U.S. We've got the win for that event being Robert Hawkins. He had 2x3 bikes, 9 voids, 2 Shadow Seers, no Troop Masters or Solitaires in a light list. And I thought this was kind of interesting. 2 Shadow Seers is kind of uncommon. But also, one of the Shadow Seers has the Suit of Hidden Knives, which I think is kind of neat. And then the other one has... Oh, where did it go? I'll talk about it some other time. So, Suit of Hidden Knives, for those of us who are used to seeing exactly and only no upgrades except Sagrass Rose. <laughs> yep. Just Mortal Wounds, but a different flavor. And then a Death Jester with the standard equipment. The only other different thing is 2 by 3 Skyweavers. So those are bike squadrons. You don't see a ton of those, even in Light lists. And then it's pretty minimal on other aspects. There's only three star weavers to go with four troop squad. So it's a more minimalist kind of list. Yeah, Two shadows uh, here is kind of neat to me. I suppose it opens up mental interrogation or war ritual as secondaries. Um, or you I do think in the future, can about, right? You can do... Yeah, foot in the future is an interesting choice. You've essentially built a melee shadow seer, which is something that I never thought was a thing. That, that is strange. <laughs> good, good for him. The uh, even with one shadow here, it's usually pretty easy to do mental interrogation. In my experience because they have a one CP uh, action and cast strat, so you yep. can you only really cast one spell on the shadow here anyway. You're like feel my pain aura or mirror of minds. That's kind of it. So fair enough. All right, we are going to jump over next to the Midcon GT, which I thought was a misspelling at first, but no, it is Mid T Con. Um, so yep. Mitzcon in Denmark. This was a 50-player five-round event, and this was won by Andreas Strachman, who is a representative of the Team uh, Team Denmark. Uh, I played him a couple of years ago in the singles at ETC. Lovely guy. Um, nice. And he was playing Orc Speed Mob with all five varieties of buggies and the Death, and the death Killer. So literally, cool. remember that one that you don't remember? No, he has that, and he painted it for a tournament. Uh, he had two of the Rocket Truck Stick Buggy, two of the Mega Truck Jet, and two of the Shotgun Trapster, and one of the other two, Custom Boom Blaster, and Boom Daka Stars Wagon. That's it. But I could be wrong, and you'll never know. Um, <laughs> and then one brick of six Death Copters, one small three, and then one of each of the planes. So one Waz Bomb and one Death Daka Jet. And this was played as free booters to get that possible to hit onto the Waz Bomb and the Daka Jet, which is still fairly reasonable. You can still trigger it with all of the other units in the list. They just know better for themselves, but they do still have um, the free booters keyword. So they trigger it for the planes, which don't benefit from the speed mob, which is one of the nice little advantages of the speed mob. Uh, so yeah, props to Andreas. Uh, he's a very, very, very competent art player. Um, playing him for years and years and years, and I respect him almost as much as it's possible for me to respect an art player, which is to say, almost like as one human being. <laughs> <laughs> love, love you, Andreas. Uh, and then Ow. finally, we have the Black Heart <laughs> 40 KGT, which is in England. This was 36 by 5 rounds. This is the one I was at. I came third. It was okay. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, yeah. would you like to run us through Mike Porter's list? Yes, you cut my joke off at the knees. I was going to be like, some scrub got third. And for first, we got Mark Porter playing Harlequins. Um, just a, real quick, Mike Porter has been playing clowns just for ages, right? That's like been a thing even before. No, is that the wrong person? I mean, he has been, but Mike is uh, Mike is a jump player and a WTC Team England player. So okay. he plays whatever he's on for the time being. So yes, he's been playing Quins for decent bit. He was playing... Um, like the Eldar and Quinn soup list. Back yeah, he was playing the soup before, yeah. right? But he's also been playing like whatever else in the between times. Mike gotcha. plays a lot of 4K. Gotcha. All right. Well, anyway, he won and he played light. Um, this is real similar to a lot of the other light stuff. The I think it might just be Matt Robertson's list. Like, might be identical. It's likely that it is. It, it's, well, they're both just Team England lists. So yeah, one Shadow Seer, one Troop Master, one Solitaire, one Jester, nine Voids, Troops and Boats. Done. Yep. I went first against them. It was horrible. Um, 
Yeah, that doesn't help you in that matchup. No. You were First against him in Hammer and Anvil. He deployed 30.1 and swift from my hive guard and went, okay, you go. <laughs> yep. It was great. Loved it. There uh, was, I loved every minute of it. There was one non-GT event that I wanted to call out just because the Aus Masters tournament happened as well, which had a lot yes. of really good players in it. And Christopher Wright won that event with Eldar Soup, which I think is something that we're going to start seeing a little bit more of coming up, especially if the balance slate hits Harlequins a little bit. And he had kind of an interesting list. So he had light in a pretty standard kind of support network, but then his Eldar craft world Eldar detachment was kind of interesting. So it was masterful shots with his ignore light cover and swift swift strikes, which is fall back and shoot with no penalty. That is interesting. So it's a little bit different. And it's a squad of dire avengers, two howling banshees, a ten man of hawks, and then three wind riders and a wave serpent. So it's kind of neat. A lot of quick moving. Kind of cool. Yeah, I hear really good things about Ten Hawks, especially this one. He took the Phoenix Plume Relic on him, which gives him a 5-up Fumo Pain. And a, a Winged Evasion gives him an Hawk invulnerable hater. save. I mean, it's fine. I think the 10-man is probably where you take those relics on him, but otherwise you probably don't. 10 almost play bearers. That would have been sure. resilient three years ago. Yeah, that's the it problem, also has right? It does also have Bahroth in it, but I don't think this is like the the final form of this combination. Because 10 Swooping Hawks can do all sorts of stuff in other lists. <laughs> Thank, yes, Flappy Boy is in every Eldar list that ever <laughs> existed in us. If you're watching, if you're listening to the show and you're not watching the YouTube video, you are missing out on wonderful content because yeah. the, video, the video cameras are truly what makes the show. Um, we do hope you are enjoying regardless. You get to watch Innis turn bright red when we tell him that he managed to win an event without losing. That's always great. Yeah. He is good at that now. He got better at it after the first one. It's true. He's gotten better records and winning. It's great. It's a shame he didn't take Crusher. If he went first in the finals, he'd have won this one too with Crusher. <laughs> I'd lost my round four to tie though. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that guy had nineteen oh. battle suits. Ah, Holy crap. That's too many. <laughs> not for not for twelve yeah. five guard, but for Crusher Stampede. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, although I said Os Masters also had Matt Morisoli in it as well, and also Simon was Gaj Gajovic. I can't pronounce that guy's last okay. name, and I'm really sorry, Simon. Thank you. Okay. Who are all really good Australian meta players. Like, really, really good players. Simon's Thick City's real, real father. I'm just like the stepdad. I just picked him up later. But like, Simon yeah. was the uh, the originator. Simon went for smokes, and Anthony was like... I can be your daddy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I was like, come here, big boy. I know you're not getting a lot of love at home. But yeah, so that was a really event. You can see a lot of good lists there if people want to look it up. It's very. And if you want to hear more about that, you could probably check out Best in Tabletop Network support Key Frontier Show, where all the best players from, uh, well, some players from, um, <laughs> some guys we know from Australia and <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand and Korea. Uh, go through the <laughs> extremes of the locations in 40k, uh, whether it's covering Australia or New Zealand or uh, man, all of these far flung. Innis, do you have any more conditionals for that statement? All, also, I do want to bring up that <coughs> that Sam was Lemon from YouTube. Sam was at the Masters, chat. dude. That event, he was at the Masters. At the but he went one He's in on three. But, but he went. One in three. So, so if you want to hear him we're not completely pretend he was not at that event, you should listen to Best in Tabletop Frontiers. Oh my god. That was so brutal. <laughs> you can't just slay people like that, man. <sighs> I don't I know I shouldn't either. Oh bring just... up what Sam said. Why you why you gotta do us like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh yes, I'm and so then sorry. Me. Some people we know who live in the wrong hemisphere is what noted noted community member Mish has to say. <sighs> I'm sweating. Okay, back to it. Whew, focus up. <laughs> okay, so that was Stats Breakdown and Results of the Week. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed that, you could always remember to check us, chuck us a like, chuck us a subscribe, chuck a comment on the YouTube video. If you're listening on any, any one of your uh, good old podcast providers, whether you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or some other ones that we don't know. Uh, drop us a review. It really helps us out with discoverability. And you should definitely watch the YouTube content because the YouTube content is the place to be. It is the most fun way to watch the show. And uh, you get to watch the second half. If you want to watch the second half, the bonus round, 
do remember to check out the YouTube subscriber option on youtube.com slash c slash best in tabletop. And now we're going to jump into a bit of a middle, into a meta breakdown. We're going to get about half an hour on this one, and then we're going to jump into Anthony's question of the week, take a break, and then we'll be back for the bonus round. So, how are you guys feeling about them Harlequin nerfs? Uh, they're coming. It's just, they're going to, it's going to depend a lot on what. Um, I, at the risk of incurring the wrath of our creative director, am not super excited about adding craft worlds to my list. I really wanted, really was more enthused about playing mono quins even before. Like once I worked out that they were good enough to play mono, I was really excited. Then there was like an exactly one game test window where I went, oh no, it's not going to stay like this. And then <laughs> now we're back to like, all right, so I'm probably going to have to include some craft worlds. Uh, I'm not super excited about that yet. For context, I haven't personally played with Hail of Doom yet, and that looks really fun. I got a buddy of mine playing it, and he seems to be having just a grand old time. So it will be interesting to adjust, I think. Well, didn't also, you buy Night Spinners already? Uh, Ennis, if you've known nothing about me, you should know that I often don't own the thing I'm currently using, or at least the modeling part is not my hand, not my gateway to play. I thought you ordered Night Spinners. I remember us talking about that. I got. I have access. I have access to one. Uh, the commission right. room has one. I got, um, I got so yeah, we have like I have like I could play Craft Worlds like tomorrow if I needed to, but like it's not the purpose like i'm just like i said i'm just less excited for that side of the book and from especially from like a team's perspective i feel like the whole of america could probably do better to, better for a conservative gunline player than me well don't <laughs> uh, play conservative gunline go play hail of doom and table people i guess that's fair you could just <laughs> light people the hell up from 18 for the most part yeah yeah break out one of these bad boys but like it shoots class <laughs> but yeah that's uh that's my feelings on the nerf. I'm I was really excited that Harlequins worked mono, and I'm a little sad that they're gonna probably take a I bullet mean, just square in the forehead. They might still work mono. Like, I don't think something like Steve Box's Dark Build is bad. Um, it depends. Probably, like, on WGC boards, you can definitely do some gaming with that. Yeah, I worry about being like too damaged the faction. Also, no rerolls the faction. It's just like a. It depends scary... how it depends how they kill voids, right? Because if you can still run three of them and not feel bad about it. Play right. about with fire and fade or the defensive um light stratum to move them after charge to move them when they get charged. You can probably still work three of them pretty well. I yeah. don't think that would be too much of an issue. I still maintain that the most problematic part of Harlequins is light. So if light doesn't get kicked around too hard, then that I think even my mono list, honestly, is still quite good. We'll see. Exactly. No, it'll be interesting to see. Um so yeah, that's kind of our, our quick hit of thoughts on the balance update. Uh, Nathan, do you want to check anything and I'll, I'll go with my thoughts next. I mean, I think because we've seen the meta gel so hard, essentially, on round one list, what we're really, ex I expect to see is Void Weavers to take a big punch. I mean, what that punch will come as, whether that'll be like squadron changes or something like that, or points increases, or both, or some changes to some of the light rules, which may happen, especially Mirror Architect, which is the Shadow Seer ability, probably going to change the phrasing on that back to what it was in 8th, where it doesn't affect model distance but instead it affects, affects range, range of weapons. Do that? I don't know that it's yep. changed. So we'll probably see something like that. It affects a few things. Like it stops things like aura ranges becoming weird or like ability ranges becoming weird. No, I'm saying I don't I think it worked that way in eighth as well. I don't think that wording actually changed, did it? I don't think I it didn't did. play I against them a ton. I thought it did, but I can't remember. It's been a while since I played eighth edition Harlequin. I have this here waiting well. available. Give me one second, I'll go and check. Yeah. What do you right. Other than that, I mean I expect Tau. Tau and Custodies to get little hits and changes. Uh, Tau and Custodies will probably get changes. No, it did work the same way. There was just was less that cared about range in 8th, I think. Okay. Like, That's... There were less abilities that were conditional being within 12 and things like right, that. Right, it was just rapid yeah. fire. You'd be like, damn it. Although, the army that I think really gets affected by Mirror Architect, like, the most is Tau. Tau. Yeah. Like, and I guess part <laughs> of me just cult. Feel Holy that. crap, Gene Sealer Cult. Well, yeah, <laughs> but for Tau, I just don't feel bad about it. For Gene Stealer Cult, I feel a little bad about it. Although it is kind of funny because there's some weird interplay there where you can no longer have lookout sir protection for your solitaire at all. 
because all the models around him count as being six inches further away. So he's the closest model. So you can shoot him. Yeah, that one is <laughs> spicy. You got to be real careful with your solitaire. I'm deploying this Star Weaver in front of the solitaire out of range of the Chatless here. You can kill this guy. It's okay. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Just so that when guy, he's though. six inches, he's still the closest model. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing the solitaire is fast, is all I'm saying. Very. But I, I have I have high hopes for the balance slate. They're doing it a week early. Hopefully it'll include maybe some points changes along with rules changes and the meta will kind of relax a little bit. I worry a little bit about Tyranids kind of coming into a meta where the three top placing factions in it all kind of get nerfed at the same time. But we'll deal with that when it happens. We can't deal with that before it happens. Yeah, exactly. Tyranids aren't even up for pre-order yet. We don't know what their built will still apply yep. into. We don't know what people will do to respond to Tyranids. And also, with every other army, good army in the game nerfed a bit, you'll have a lot more bandwidth to respond to the one best army. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that was... hopefully, Tyranids don't make too much of a domination. That was the issue I definitely felt super hard going into Cherokee was that like I built out a list and I was like, oh, like I'm pretty good into the heavy crisis Tau build. But my custodes matchups a little rocky. It was really hard to like build around multiple yeah. things. And that At was least like, now, if it's if it does turn out that maybe they don't quite get the hard enough as far as they want, they wanted to and turn it's pretty strong. At least you can just be like, OK, it's two lists I, and they both kind of do similar enough things and that they're invulnerable save armies and blah, blah blah like there's there's a lot of ways we could justify why yeah there's it could be a little better and hopefully if they get the harlequins enough right and it's just tyranids whenever there's only one really top army it tends to be slightly less unhealthy not not unhealthy but less unhealthy like when it was just drakari it was a little better than when it was drakari and admech um right. and you could like you could build a list like the ultramarines and victors list that could just or even just the Admech list before Admech got a book even would still just light you up. You could take the town on a Drakari list if you built for it. And you only really had to build for Drakari and like Dark Angels. Ooh, terrifying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when, when there's one clear best army, it becomes a lot easier to counter meta and counterplay to that. It's not what everybody looks forward to in a game of 40k, not everybody who loves an event, but you have options there at least. Right. So hopefully they get the they get the Harlequins nerf right, they get the Tau and Custodies nerf right as well. And then maybe they chuck they're not going to chuck a buff to the bad armies, but if they chucked a buff to like Sisters and Death Guard um, cool. and Space Marines at this point, I would, don't think anybody would complain either. Yeah. The other thing with Nids too is a lot of their stuff keys off the monster keyword, and there's a ton, like, we don't really use it a ton, but there's a ton of like monster hunting things in the various books. Um, so if that ever becomes good and you can like actually focus the problem on it. Is but... a lot of that focuses around like Poison 2 plus and Poison 3 plus against monsters and stuff like that, and Leviathan no sells that, unfortunately. So Leviathan would, yeah. but it just really depends on what yeah, it's being good. A lot of them are plus damage, too. Like, there's a lot of, like, various ones that do. I don't know. It seems like it'd be good. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that's, like, what uh, Wounds of the 2+, plus, ex except against monsters and vehicles, doesn't really matter. But there is a decent right. amount of stuff that's just not good against vehicles, but really good against everything else, like Drakari running a lot of poison. Poison, yeah. Yeah, racks. Pain in the backside. Uh, just, go, just go play 171 racks, guys. You'll love it. Um, don't do it. Don't hurt yourself. Yeah. They're going to kill you anyway. Just don't bother. <laughs> so, should we talk about the uh, what have you been doing to deal with the current meta as a player? Like, what's your what's your process been as for both of you for playing in this not great period? Like going back as far as Trikari, what What's your uh, which is a year ago now? That's horrifying. Uh, so I had the same answer then that i have now which is playing it uh i this is a thing that i talk about somewhat frequently that i won't really play an army that doesn't have like a good odd like if i go into an event with an army my expectation for the list before i like my pilot skill comes into play is that i will go x1 or x0 um i'm comfortable enough with an x2 but i'm really looking for like an x1 x0 at the list level and if it's on me to mess it up i always try and keep it so that like my ability to play is what determines if i do well or not um and i don't want to get gate kept by my list so in the current meta my answer has been playing the thing that's best and then getting really good at murdering other people playing the same thing um, I lost the Drakari Mirror exactly twice uh, in the entire season that I played it. Uh, both were to Sean Maiden. Um, 
and that's it. And the light, I played a mirror last weekend, and I just like I had more like game experience, so I was able to overcome there. And as long as I don't know, that's that's been a very obviously successful process. It obviously, roll back four ups as well, right? Uh, no, it was more like just sh- like I. <laughs> you you <laughs> like the the harlequin mirror is interesting because it really in my experience anyway comes down to who uses the combat characters better because if you can line the combat characters better than your opponent can you can really wreck a toll like if a solitaire hits a tr- uh, void squad it's going to be bad if you spend the cp same thing with the troop master and so on and so forth you just have to be able to line those up with a degree of consistency and know what should be going into what into the matchup beforehand. Uh, if you just YOLO into them, like you are frankly able to do with a lot of the rest of the armies in the meta, you'll just die. Uh, but you know, you gotta keep your, uh, you gotta keep your blade sharp, but yeah, that's how I've been handling the wacky meta has just been playing what I perceive to be best for myself and how I play and working it backwards from there and trying to figure out how to win the merit, uh, win the mirror. Cool. And I want to just quick touch on, not a, not a preachy bit, but Anthony's, resp- Anthony's response to this is completely valid. And if you, the way you enjoy playing 4K is that you enjoy winning and you are giving, justifying yourself reasons to why you're not um, like bandwagoning onto the best armies in the game, um, maybe rethink whether you're actually in it for winning or you're in it for a different reason. Um, yeah. It is completely valid. You don't have to be in it for the win. But if your response to, oh my God, Void Reavers is the best in the game, is I'm going to play something else, and whether that's for because you don't want to buy nine Rodgers before they get nerfed, or because you don't have an event until after you think they're going to be nerfed. It's all fine, but it all, you know, at the core of it, if your goal is to win, you should be coming up with reasons to buy the army rather than, or to play the army than not to play the army. Right. Um, and there's also, like, room within the top factions to find differences. Like, I only play six Void Weavers because I think it's better to have more other things, um, especially in the given mirror, which is what I'm building for. You saw it when I was playing Jakari, too. I would change... My list would be different than a lot of the other stuff that would be. Yeah, because you, know, you like to be a snowflake, it's okay. It's definitely not snowflaking. If I thought it was better, I would just play it, as shown by my faction choice. See, he says that, but he doesn't walk that walk. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nathan, what's your, uh, from the from the let's, I'm trying to win Super Majors level of it, what's the what's the general feeling been for I mean, dealing with the last year? Okay. Like, I know you played Drakari, so it's hard to on that front to go back all the way but yeah so for me when i like i started playing competitive 40k like more seriously more recently so i really only started playing 40k regularly and actually really at all at the end of eighth edition and i played drakari for most of ninth edition so far and for me it was very similar to anthony was you have to learn how to be better than like the next best drakari player that you play but also, I was still learning all the other ins and outs of it. So I was mostly just focusing on practice to learn fundamentals and watching and talking to people who were better players than me to learn kind of tricks, especially like little combat tricks and stuff like that, because the fight phase is really complicated. And it it's not something you realize how complicated it is until you start playing at a higher level. And then you're like, oh, my God, there's like tons of tiny little movement things that you have to deal with. So for me, it's always been like where are the points of failure in my own game and how can I just improve upon them? Um, so that's a lot of what I do in my practice is I try to practice specific things and try more and more things and then see what works. Also, I talk to Anthony and Ennis a lot. That tends to improve how I like deal with and like analyze things because they're both better players than I am. So it's good to find those faction experts and see how they're also working on it and then like, Try to work on how you play. Like if you're going to stick with your faction, even though it's losing a lot in the current meta, you just have to, and that like, that's the way you enjoy playing. Yeah. You have to have a justification, a reason. Yeah. You have to fit set your own goals when you're choosing to not play the best thing. Um, that is definitely an yeah. important step. Or you could just try being a way better player than your opponents. That does work too. Uh, but that's kind of, a, it does. it's kind of a winning the game wins the game kind of argument. Uh, if you're already a great player, you could probably go and win tournaments. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But that doesn't yeah. help you. Yeah, so I'm, I'll go into go into my. Sorry, Nathan, do you want to finish out there? No, I was just going to say, just set your goals appropriately. Like, if you're not going to play Harlequins, then know what you want and how you want to get to it, and like what you want to get out of 40k at the moment. And if that means stepping back from competitive 40k when the meta is like not great, then that's fine. Like, do something else. 
if that's yeah, not what this you is want. a game like, you're playing it to have fun if you're not having fun disengage for a bit it's okay the game will mm-hmm. still be here when you get back go and paint your toys go play a crusade league go and have fun it's okay tournaments aren't everything i know that there's a small difficulty with that in that like you book tournaments pretty far in advance usually right. uh, and you're kind of rolling dice on is the meta gonna suck when i get there um but also don't be afraid to re-roll it's fine what reroll factions or yeah like play yeah. something else it's okay if that's an option for you it is definitely yeah. something you can do uh go and have your fun a different way i'll go into mine i'm going to use uh, the example of i'm just going to like exemplar my tournament last weekend um obviously i came off the back of a pretty good manchester i was really i'm really loving my crusher stampede list uh i think it's really strong but i also can't fly with it because it would have been really expensive to fly with it, it would have cost me like doubled the price of my turn of my tournament and i was like i can't justify that so i set went into the event with the goal of I need to play an army that I'm going to find fun. It's not going to be too strenuous because I don't want to burn out the weekend before I start a new job and that I can like still have a reasonable chance of beating anything that's not Harlequins. Is basically what I want. So I went, all right, let's just play 12 Hive Guard and see what happens. I spent three hours thinking about 40k total over the weekend. I went out for dinner with some great friends. Did all, did all the good fun stuff at the tournament. I taught up some people, played a 36 player GT and a player I don't normally see. Met a bunch of new players, putting his Mike Porter, one of the best players in the world. Great. Get met all my goals. Went four and one. Fine. Didn't think about 40k while I was doing it. Brilliant. But I also didn't really have a shot winning the tournament. And you can, like, one person wins a tournament. That's like that. That's the most important thing to remember. That whether it's 40 players or 200 players, one person gets a trophy. It is statistically unlikely to be you, regardless of who you are, what you are, or what you're playing. Um, even if you're Richard Siegler, I still think it's statistically unlikely that he won LVO that year. Anthony. One of the most important pieces of advice I ever got from someone was from Sean Maiden. And he said, the minute you lose your first tournament game, even if you win every other tournament game you ever play, you will be, on average, someone with a loss. Unless you are permanently undefeated, you will be X and 1 will be your average for forever. Whether that's a statistically significant average or not is Nathan's fucking side of the coin. But... The second you drop that first game, your fucking career average is X and one. <laughs> Do not assume you will win, regardless of who you are, every tournament you show up at. It's real rough down that road. It's really hard. And if you set the expectation that every, every tournament you go to that you're going to win, you are going to set, you are setting yourself up for a fail case in almost every scenario you play. Even if you, like, John Lennon doesn't win every tournament he goes to. Uh, I um, I did for four I did for four weeks. It felt great, and then I came third at one. Oh my god, what a shame! Like there's there's now a blemish on my ITC record. What whatever will I do? We yeah. we played. I played a lot of 40k. I have lost more games than most people have played. Like of 40k players, we just including everybody, and we've all lost more games than most people have played because we've lost the game. Um, yep. But most people play a couple of games a year, a couple of games a month. Like I don't know. I've lost more tournament games than that this season. Yep. Like get over it. You're gonna lose games. Um, accepting that there are things you can do to mitigate that and that there are levels that you have to be willing to step to do that i could have spent more money on flights i could have gotten a train to bristol which is a 16 hour train um uh, not happening uh, i could have tried to borrow an army i could have played harlequins like these are all things i could have done i could have messaged my friend and been like yo i'd like to borrow nine volumes they'll fit in my carry-on it'll be fine they would have all broken in my carry-on but they would have fit that's the important thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but those are all things that i was like i'm not willing to do that and that sets a ceiling on your expectations for an event and you have to be willing to understand that you are going to set yourself artificial limitations whether that artificial limitation is i'm not buying nine void weavers before the balance update that happens in six weeks after the core comes out yep that, that's fine you were allowed to set those limitations to yourself but what you can't do is set those limitations and be like yo i think i still deserve to win this gt nope you might still win it like during the height of Drakari, I won a GT with Black Templars because I just played WTC format and lost and just played for a small loss. Those are things you can do if you're in WTC format. It's great. Uh, but I also did it with um, demons and uh, demons and play, de- demons of Death Guard. I just played a Bellacore Demon Engines list and I was like, all right. And then we I drew with the Drakari player and then came second to the tournament. It was great. He was like, all right, I just don't need to beat you. I just need to play a list that doesn't all lose to you and right. play like a bitch in my best mission. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Like there are always things you can do um even in the worst matters like you're probably not going to be the person that innovates the list that breaks the meta open and you find the thing that defeats harlequins nine times out of ten 
nobody's going to do that. Like the army has a seventy percent win rate. If you're doing that, your army's problematic too, probably, or exploiting a very, very strange weakness in the list. Yep. So don't like pay attention to what other people are doing. Um, there will be people who are winning games against Harlequins. I watched a Custos player beat Harlequins this weekend, and I'm still not sure how. I know it's because the Harlequins player timed out. Like that's partly it. I, Dude, I get that. But last weekend, I watched TJ put a beating on a good light harlequins player with eight void weavers with crusher stampede just beat him into the ground like 20 0 in wtc it was like a 70 point differential just blasted him there is never zero hope and harlequins <laughs> is probably the most broken we've seen since yeah. i've been playing it i was saying this to, i was saying this to mike when i uh when i paired into him i was like i'm just gonna go like i'm just if i play you i'm just gonna make sure it's in dawn of war i'm gonna go first I'm gonna yeah double fire my hardcore with exploding sixes and they're gonna hit 48 times and you're yeah. gonna table on turn one and he looked at me and was like yeah you're not gonna do that but if you do i'll be really impressed yeah <laughs> and you yeah. can play like that's an out it's not a good out it's an out I, you're never zero percent starting this game i was significantly worse than most of my local meta and i just played turbo aggressively as my out and that has since developed into my literal brand but the like that works like you can just play to your out sometimes that is huge and like sometimes your out is a 20 percent chance of happening but it's better than the zero percent chance you have if you just play to the script exactly yeah um you are all you are always responsible for being the person who identifies that there is a play that is a higher percent, higher win rate percent than what you are doing at the moment. Because yep. if you rock up to the table and your game plan at the Harlequins is to just kind of do things and go through the motions, you're going to come second in that game. Um, if your game come plan second. is, it sounds a lot better than lose, you know. Uh, <laughs> if your game plan is YOLO, um, twelve inch charges happen one in thirty six times. That's true. If you can get you can get that you can get that six inches away. Um, I, I genuinely, I said to Mike when I charged, I charged him with my uh, my my drills on my fucking acolytes. I was like, my game plan here: roll a bunch of sixes, and I rolled enough sixes to one shot a void weaver. But I only, but it was like, oh, I only actually hit four times. Just three of them were sixes. But it's like it's not a, not a far shot of variance off of me killing two void weavers there, hacking up the th the second squad, and then I had a, I could have had all three all three squads of void weavers done turn yep. turn two, and like that's an out. You can play to that. It's not good. Like if the odds of rolling four sixes on or rolling like five sixes on eight attacks, not super high, turns out. Yep. But you can try for stuff like that, and you probably should be if your game plan is lose otherwise. Yeah. Um identifying when like the rough, rough math, like a nine inch charge is twenty eight percent chance to make it. So that's worse odds than banking. So if you're looking at a game and you like you've banked games on nine inch charges before, I think we've all done that, right? Like, you're like, I gotta hit this deep strike charge. If I hit it, I get to win the game. Maybe you've got a superior rule. It doesn't matter. But ganking the game on a five up is 5% more likely than backing the game on a nine charge. It just sounds a lot worse, right? Um, I don't know. I'm just, all I'm saying is that there is always an opportunity that you can find, unless your opponent is incredibly good and doesn't make mistakes, which isn't a thing. Uh, that, like, nobody hasn't made mistakes. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. I'm gonna spoil no. that right now. No one. Makes zero mistakes. There are players who make less mistakes, and there are players who make less exploitable mistakes. There are still mistakes. Yep. Um, people are sloppy. People are lazy. People time out. There, people there are, are all tired. Players. Exactly. You you will never. No one will ever play a perfect game of 40k, um, and it's unrealistic to expect yourself or your opponent to do so. If you're not expecting yourself to do so, why are you expecting your opponent to play a perfect game of 40k? Find gaps. Exploit them. Um, they're not always big gaps. There are sometimes gaps that require a wild variance. Sometimes the gap is like, I need these four hive guard shots to kill four harlequins. Um, it's not likely. It's an out. Yep. It, you yeah, just need to find your path to victory, like you exactly. said. Like even if that path to victory is gonna happen one percent of the time, that's your only path to victory. You just have to try. Like there's not no like if you if you try and you fail, you have tried. It is sometimes it's easy to accept the comfortable loss that there was nothing you could do about, which I do think is something to be said. If you can preserve your mental state a little bit, like if this is like a round two game and you're out is, you know, playing your ass off, burning yourself out, using all your clock time, maybe don't. Like, you, you can, 
But if it's like, you know, it's the Hail Mary, the one, the 1% chance into the 1% chance, um, there is an argument for just accepting a Christmas loss and taking a lunch break, going, having a break, disassociating from the game for a little bit. Um, your mental ability to play the game is a resource that you should manage at tournaments. Yep. Um, but at the same time, don't give, don't give your opponents free wins. Uh, I've had plenty of opponents just like concede on turn two for no reason when they're like, yeah, I've lost a bunch of stuff and I don't really feel like I can come back in this. I'm like, well, okay. I've, I'm still breaking it, but okay, yeah, fine. I'll take the win. Yeah. I'm not right. going to talk you out of giving me free points. Yep. Um, I understand that that is a choice you should make in last resort situations. If it's like, you know, it's it's game three and you want to go for dinner and your friends are already finished and you want to go, like, fine, who cares? It's a game. Yep. Um, but if it's game five and you've got nowhere to be after this, you should probably try the 1% stuff. Yeah, I usually Plus, don't... if it works, you'll look really smart. <laughs> yeah, I try and do that stuff, like, almost at pregame, where I'm like, oh, this matchup's bad. All right, like, secondaries go into the Hail Mary bucket, like, primary plays, deployment, like, all of it is like, all right, let's see how this goes. <laughs> I, uh, I've been telling this story because I think it's funny. Um, I picked Baharov, I picked, against Baharov, I played him four times at Manchester, and in every single game, I picked Assassinate against him, knowing that I was going to score, like, six points on it, at best, but what it does is it means the Bahara stays the feck away from my hive guard. Yeah, he's terrified of smite. Yeah, yeah he <laughs> doesn't stay, like that. He just jumps between his home objectives, and it was magical. I didn't have to worry about him at all because I picked assassinate and just conceded nine points. I was just like, I'll just take a primary off him. It's fine. It's no difference. Yeah, I had an opponent at Austin after I picked assassinate. There was the Thick City Mirror. Put all his combat characters into a boat and leave the table, and I was like, you. You understand what you've just done? And I took the entire table because I had all my combat characters and all my Talos. That's it. I didn't get 15 on Assassinate, but he scored zero the whole game on primary. <laughs> Never scored primary at all. Okay. Yeah. Like, there is there is playing to your outs and there is making stupid decisions that, that that's one of those outplaying yourself secondaries where oh, yeah. you're, you're denying your opponent Giving up your own points isn't the same thing as denying your opponent points, right? Yep. Giving up your own points is something that you can play around. You can attempt to gain points in other ways, right? You might decide, okay, I'm okay with only with capping myself at 12 on the second race. Well, it's the same thing we do every time we take rod, right? Or yep. retrieve knock on data. You're accepting that you're giving up three points because the ease of the secondary will result in you having an easier game plan in other parts of the game. That That is what it is. You are saying yep. that the amount of resources it will take me to gain banners is uh, to gain a 15 on to gain 13 plus points on banners is not worth the investment that i would have to make in resources from other places and that will allow me to play better on my other secondaries play better on primaries play better in denial kill my opponent's stuff better that, that's yep. the trade you're making you're saying rod is easy so i'm going to accept a point plus yep. you can do that in any secondary you can like when you pick assassinate when it's worth less than 15 points you can pick no prisoners when it's 10 like these are all things you I can take, do i do that all the time i take assassinate so, no prisoners for 10 constantly yeah because it turns out 10 points is enough on a good on a secondary. If yeah. you have a game plan, you don't need 15s. Like so we're playing for hundreds is so overrated. And it's my my biggest foible with the um like the previous LGT format, which they thankfully fixed, uh, is that you were so heavily incentivized to score like 97 points that we were like, Yeah, you just can't pick Scramblers, these tournaments. Yep. It, it turns out you probably could have if you were like scoring ninety it's like ninety threes, you'd have been all right. But it doesn't feel good when you're like uh, if I have one bad game and score an 85, I'm out of the event. So I'm yeah, just, just going to play for hundreds everywhere else. So yep. that I can have that 185 and still pop. And I, I that was my biggest problem with the format. And now that that's been mostly fixed, now that LGT is going to like up to 11 rounds, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Right. Um, but you can make your, your secondary points and your primary points are a resource you can exploit, which is a really weird thing to say because we normally talk about exploit resources in terms of like your command points, your units. Um, but you can you can pick a secondary like... People used to do this into Dracaria a decent bit where you'd take assassinate so that they played like a bitch with their characters. Or well, so that some player could play like a bitch with their characters. Or they would play more defensively with their characters than they otherwise might have. They might have taken a less risky play in in close games because yeah, 100%. yeah. And like you're right to do that. Like you you absolutely if the situation is you throw away your succubus to deny your opponent four points, but you give up three assassinate and your play might not work, like right. that that becomes a question that the Dracari player has to ask. And yeah. sometimes they'll make the wrong they'll make the wrong call on that, or sometimes they'll make the right call and they'll get unlucky. And yeah. that that's a resource you can use. Whether, that was a huge part of my list building yeah. in Jakari was that I would take three characters so that people wouldn't take assassinate, so I could do whatever I wanted with them. Yeah, and then people would take assassinate against you anyway, and it would and be play like, differently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yep. that is a genuine that is a resource you can use. Um, taking banners. So this is one that I um, 
I went to we went to lunch with a friend of mine, Zach, who ended up beating Harlequins in round five with Custodes at um, the, the event I was at this weekend. And I was like, yeah, just take super defensive secondaries and bodyguard hold an objective with Trajan, raise banners on all three of them, and then the Harlequins are going to have to come to you because you're, you're going to have the same secondary plan as them and they can't risk that you go second and get a better option they or that they miss, a turn, they miss a turn or something. And then the Harlequin player had to go Gregson on him and the custom player went, all right, cool back into you and his the Harlequin stuff went away because he had a good role and then the Harlequin player timed out and he won the game. That's yep. like, that isn't out. You can you can take secondaries to a force your opponent to interact with them. Not because of the best secondaries, but because they change how the game is. Uh um, Harlequins are significantly less durable in melee. If you can get them to come to you, it's a very different game. Yeah, because you can hit them on twos or threes in melee, whereas you can't in shooting. Especially if yep. you're like plus one to hit in, and hit on twos. There's a lot of stuff in the game that's like plus one to hit that hits on twos base. Um, that oh, doesn't yeah. care about mirage launchers like um, orc war bosses are plus one to hit um, and hit on two space. Drazar is plus one to hit and Sora and Kibai like from turn three onwards. Three, three. yep, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, two in real space race. I know you don't think that's real, and I agree with you, but I'm saying it anyway. Yeah, um, in the fake space raid. I mean, you find your game plan and you pick your secondaries to fit with it. If your game plan is make them come to you, pick the secondaries and make them come to you, right? Like, yeah. If you can win a, a game, game with 60 and points. To, and you need a tactic. You can, yeah. A 60 point win is still a win. Very important caveat. Keep in mind that making them come to you does not do a whole lot if they were already planning to. The amount of yes. times I've seen people when I was playing like Thick City or something be like, well, now you gotta come to me. I'm like, I was doing that anyway, so... Like, and now I have a reason to. Now I have extra incentive. The yeah. the level of, like, eye glow I would get when I was playing Thick City and my opponent would pick to the last was, whoo, oh my. That was the best, because that was like, oh, I could pick one less secondary and it doesn't even matter. My third secondary could be a psychic secondary. It's not even important. Like, the... Just keep that in mind when you're making yeah. plays. You have to be, be making judgment calls yeah. on this one. And this is yeah. where a lot of meta knowledge, and this is the kind of stuff you can be building up even in a bad meta, where yep. you can still un you can still get understandings of what your list damage output is, what kind of levels of damage you can take, what levels of damage you need to be inflicting to have gameplays that will allow you to have stuff left alive at the end of the game. It's all stuff you can build heuristics of, you can have mental pictures, understandings of. Um, I realize I'm just saying the same thing kind of like four times there. You can build this up even in times where the game is not good. Yep. Yeah, you can build up your fundamentals. Like, you can still practice all of your fundamental 40k skills like assessment. Yeah. Assessment is like the hardest skill, I think, too. Like assessing what your opponent can and cannot do. So hard. And like how they how their armies are gonna play and stuff like that. Yep. Like my biggest example and the one that Anthony like first sprayed me with a spray bottle for was when I left Hellions on the table into Orc Artillery. And the Orc Artillery killed all my Hellions right away. Because I didn't think about the fact that I probably should have just put them in deep strike and I didn't consider what my opponent's army could do to mine. And that was a top table game. Like I lost the the top table match because when I looked at my opponent's list, I was like, no, I think I can hit them with never yeah. station lightning reflexes and they'll be okay. And that's wrong. You should be able to assess your opponent's play and then like pick something. Or you're sat there like, well, if they're shooting my Hellions, they're not shooting something else that I think is more important. Yeah. Um, we had this 100%. when I was playing the, the Iron Hands Vanguard Veterans list sort of towards the end of last year. Uh, and I was speaking to Nassim about it and he was like, yeah, this was when rocket trucks were like an eight eight units in, like eight in the army, nine in the army. And he was like, yeah, your Vanguard Veterans are your best unit in the matchup, but they're dead if they start on the table, so just deep strike them and hit nines. And that was more reliable because nothing else in the army died to rocket trucks, but Vanguard sure did. So, I don't know, why are you starting them on the board? Just hit nines. Uh, it's more reliable for them than starting on the board. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, or eights yeah. with those Hellions, right? Just, I just or kept them off the board, I could have shot them on turn two. Yeah. You have options, and sometimes it's just about risk assessment. And that's a skill you get by learning the meta and your opponent's armies. Yeah. You know how everybody loves redeploys because you can like put units into reserve for free, you can chase them around. If you just put them in the perfect place the first time going around, even better than a redeploy. Uh, and just the perfect place is in reserve. There you go. <laughs> there very often I deploy my Harlequin list super defensively, trying to hope that my opponent will deploy aggressively, and then I will go first, and then I get to redeploy aggressively. But if I go second, I just stand there. I'm like, okay, go ahead. 
Um, I would much rather spend the CP to be like, let's go get you than yeah, the those, this, I've always found with redeploys that cost CP that you should always set up assuming the worst case scenario um, yep. because then you won't want the CP to do other things. And then if you go first, you don't need the CP anyway. That that was always the, the trick with like the Yanari list with Phantasm was that you would just deploy assuming you were going second. And if you went first, you didn't need those two CP. You were going to table them. Yeah, opponent was dead now. Exactly. Yeah. Especially uh, if they don't have a redeploy, it's particularly rough. Yeah. And I mean if you have um if you have a like a pregame redeploy, like you've paid CP for for telling of locus in a Grey Knights list or um should you got a taste in internet or anything like that, um the way you should generally do it is deploy very neutrally with almost your entire army, and then like however many units you have that can deploy redeploy with the ability, double that and then put two defensively and two aggressively. And then just swap from there, or like two, one neutrally, one aggressively, one defensively, one one aggressively, whatever combination that you feel is best. But always have like two and two, so you can just go. Dur, 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 dur. Here's a here's a thing for you that I didn't know until I reread the codex. You know the turreted redeploy that you get for the warlord trait. Can't redeploy the guy that has the warlord trait. Anthony, you muted. Yes, I did know that. Uh, I did not. I, fa- I found that out on like. Basically on accident, because I was like, because someone was like, yeah, basically someone said I could let them redeploy like four units or just like a weird number. And I was like, what? Let me see that. And then I looked at it and I was like, hey, you can't redeploy the guy that has it. Yeah, it's only two units. Yeah. But yeah. it's like, yeah, you're a murder flyer. It's going to be a real feeling real confident if he wants to deploy on the line. That guy always gets the safe position. <laughs> yeah, that guy is very important. I wonder if that'd be real crazy if that guy sticks, the Norton Walms man. Uh, I hope he does, because he's just cool. I think ignoring involves is just a cool thing to have in the game. It's yep. very balanced and fun. Um, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, I like anyway. ignoring involves. <laughs> I think things that ignore involves are cool, but that's just me. I like conditional ignoring involves, but I also hate conditional ignoring involves because it feels really bad. Like I don't like the. This is tangential, but I don't like the guy who's like roll a five up and you ignore saves. Oh no, I don't like that at all. I yeah, like it so when like it's the, like spend a stratagem. Yeah, or Gene, so like Gene Circle relic, have that for, for uh, one of the, for Hive Call, and I think there's a dark, there's a Warlord trait for Harlequins that does it as well. Is that the dark one? Or like if you roll a five up, there's a pivotal. There's a either pivotal roll or a Warlord. Trait. It's a pivotal yeah. roll that's five up ignore in walls, and then yeah. there's a Warlord trait that's five up to a mortal wound. Those are yeah, simple. so yeah, so the the that kind of stuff I don't like because it take take something that's already pretty swingy and makes it even more swingy. Um yep. it's like on a five up your opponent fails and involves like I, I don't like that. Uh what I like is you know the Catan strategy where you can spend two CP to make it ignore involves. Right. Um right. I, like I think those are game. cool. I think those are an interesting thing to have action access to. Right. Uh but yeah, I anyway, I think we are gonna call it there for the meta discussion because we've kind of like spun our wheels. Spun our wheels. Yeah, we've been going about this for a while. So we're gonna take a break for uh, 10 minutes in just a second but we are going to go with anthony's question of the week so as we have been doing for the last couple of episodes anthony has prepared a wonderful question for us he is going to read this out to you and if you would like to leave a message in the chat we will go through them during the uh, the break when we come back from grabbing a glass of water and if otherwise you can leave them in the youtube comments and we will have a read of those and we will shout out our favorite one in the bonus round of next week's episode so we'll be shouting out our favorite response if we found one uh, we don't always get youtube comments but uh, we would love them we would really like you to interact because it makes us look better and uh, that makes us feel better. And feeling better is what it's all about, right? Something like that. I don't know. I'm just... mm-hmm. um, so yeah, uh, Anthony will be reading out his question and then we were going to take a 10 minute break and then we will be back for the bonus round. Cool. I am lagging. Can you hear me? Or are we good? We can absolutely good. hear you, Anthony. All right, cool. So my question this week is what is your favorite army or army list, like specific type? to play against i as an example actually i'll leave you my answer in part two but like <laughs> any army any edition any time what is what, your what favorite did you, what did you most play play against? against yeah bam cool so it is currently 1 15 a.m in the uk anthony and nathan what time is it for you 8 15 p.m on the east coast of the u.s 7 15 p.m in the middle of the united states so 5.15 p.m. on the West Coast. Uh, bad math. Uh, so we're going to be back in 10 minutes. So that will be 25 past your regional equivalent. Uh, and we will be returning with a bonus round. If you are here in the live chat, please stick around. We will be back in a couple of minutes. I'm going to grab a glass of water. Uh, and then we will be having a bit of banner, a bit of discussion. And this will get pulled out of the uh, pulled out of the VOD. If you are listening on the podcast feed, 
this is the end of the show for you guys. Thank you very much for being a part of the show. We love and appreciate everything you do. Uh, if you would like to hear the bonus round, you can do that by becoming a YouTube subscriber or YouTube subscription member. I don't actually remember what it's called off the top of my head. Uh, that is a couple of dollars a month. Member? Uh, yeah, it's like eight, ten something dollars a month. And that gets you access to all of the bonus content, whether that's uh, chasing the narrative second half or the um, the rest of the battle reports that uh, Colin and the rest of the guys up on the on the west coast have been doing. Uh, those are all really good. Uh, you also get access to the bonus round of the show. If you would like to do it for free, you can check out the YouTube live stream, which is at youtubecom tabletop and there you can watch the live streams every day or every Tuesday, <laughs> every Tuesday at midnight GMT. Uh, we will be here for about two hours, and you can watch the bonus round for free if you are here on the live stream. If you would like to get a notification for that, please do drop a subscription. And finally, the last way you can support the sh to support the show is by joining us at patreoncom tabletop. That'll get you access to the Discord for ten dollars a month which is one of the best places to be in 40k. There's always some great discussion. We've had a, had a bunch of arguments today and it's been really fun. I always enjoy having a good 40k argument. So yeah, uh, thank you very much everybody for listening and we'll be back in about 10 minutes for the bonus round.